Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm actually uh, based in uh, San Diego, California, so I'm near the uh, headquarters of Life Technologies. So I, uh, normally I cover you know, Southern California, Arizona, and New Mexico, so it's, it's really, really fun to be down here and uh, get away from, <laughs> from my own work right now. Um, I have to say I am uh, a little tired and disappointed in myself because, um, you know, not because you're know, worried about this presentation today, but uh, some of my Argentinian coworkers took us out last night for dinner and we went and saw a tango show and I just have to admit I was up all night dreaming about being a tango superstar <laughs> and uh, I quickly figured out, you know, after practicing a couple moves in the room, I'm not going to be a tango superstar. So, at the most, I can, I can do that. <laughs> so anyway, um, we'll all agree that I should stick with my day job, and I'll present to you, uh, you know, one of my babies in the company. I've been associated with a product called the Open Array. It's a nanoliter qPCR technology, and uh, we have our new system now that's called the Quant Studio 12K Flex. You've heard earlier today, um, you know. Um, uh, discussion of Quant Studio and how it actually ties into genetic analysis, how it actually relates to you know ion torrent PGM next generation sequencing. So typically when we you know do these talks, uh, I actually come after the next generation sequencing part. And the reason why obviously is because this is a uh, you know qPCR technology, which is a validation platform. So in the workflow in the paradigm of you know genetic analysis, of course we're always starting with hypothesis-free discovery on you know, an ion torrent platform or a next-gen sequencing platform. And then you come back afterwards and do a, a more refined pinpoint validation uh, using qPCR technology. So uh, to start, um, I always like to start off a little bit with a TACMAN overview of the chemistry. Many of you are probably familiar you know, with TACMAN chemistry and maybe the differences of that uh, you know, assay as opposed to you know, a generic labeling approach. Uh, so I'll start off talking about TACMAN, and then uh, a brief introduction into the open array uh, technology in general, and how it flows into this new Quant Studio system. And then I think the bulk of the talk, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the machine in general. You know, you saw the instrument out there; it was like it's a very you know nice looking big box, uh, and we'll describe in detail, you know, all the features, the ins and outs of not only the hardware but the software as well. And then uh, you know, quickly talk about some applications, uh, some you know. Uh, I'll show you some screenshots of posters uh, that I'm aware of that were just released at uh, recent conferences uh, highlighting this technology and you know, all the various applications that it could be used for. And then also I'd like to jump in a little bit after that into a discussion of digital PCR. Uh, digital PCR is something that's gaining a lot of interest uh, you know, around the world right now because it's different, very different from qPCR. And uh, a lot of times where qPCR stops or reaches a limit and what it can do, then digital PCR is another technique that can actually be employed to uh, you know, get a more refined answer. And so we'd we'll like, like to talk about digital PCR as well, because this platform is not only a key PCR system, but also a digital PCR system. And then uh, finally, uh, you know, I'd like to you know, introduce a little bit about our, 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 our discussion about our somatic mutation detection assays. This is new chemistry, uh, which not only can be used on traditional you know, plates, you know, like a 96-volt plate or 3D4-volt plate in single-tube format, but it can also be used, uh, and a lot of researchers are doing this now, combining that with open array technology to really get um, a very you know, refined look at uh, rare variants. And then the last bullet point, which you don't see because I forgot it, <laughs> and it's the most important bullet point, is really the, the key question and answer session. So, I hope you know, I can spur some discussion. Uh, we have plenty of time before lunch. And uh, without further ado, let me uh, launch forward into TACMAN chemistry. So the, uh, a brief overview again for those that are not familiar. Uh, you know, this is technically called the five prime exonuclease assay. You know, we for, refer to this as TACMAN. Everybody in the company calls it TACMAN now, and everybody in the industry and the research community calls it TACMAN. And does, does anyone know where the name TACMAN came from? Anybody wonder? I mean, TAC, TAC is TAC polymerase, right? Yeah. TAC polymerase enzyme. But what about MAN? Yeah. Think, about, think of the video game, Pac-Man, right? Pac-Man's going through and he's chewing. He's eating all the little points. That's, that's not a joke. This is literally where the name TAC-Man came from. Because what's happening is the five, uh, five to three prime exonuclease activity of the enzyme is encountering 
primers in its path and basically chewing it up, digesting. So if we start with the forward primer over here, and then the polymerase is moving and encounters the TACMAN probe, which is you know short oligonucleotide, has a fluorescent label on the five prime end, has a quencher molecule on the three prime end. As a polymerase encounters that probe, it just simply digests it. And so when I digest that probe, we liberate fluorescence. So this fluorescence that you see that's liberated in solution, it's separated away from the quencher, and then what happens is we get a rise in fluorescence level. So at every PCR cycle, you know, we're doubling the amount of uh, you know, fluorescent molecules that are in solution, and so we're getting an increase. We get this sigmoidal uh, increase as we go through PCR cycles. And so, of course, you know, the, the data that we collect then is at this point right here. You just draw a threshold. And that's basically how it works. Now, this is you know, the case for, I mean, there's variations of this, right? This is an example of a, a gene expression assay. If you're, for example, a genotyper and you're looking at you know, biallelic determinations of a polymorphism, you're basically going to use a SNP TACMAN assay, which looks exactly like this. The only addition then is that we have an extra primer in there. So you know, we have one primer that's specific for one allele that has, a, uh, you know, let's say, the FAM fluorophore. And then there's another oligonucleotide in there, which is identical, but just different by a single base. It's complementary to the other allele, and that has a different fluorophore. So that's all like, mixed together. And that's what we actually have inside a TACMAN assay in that single tube. And uh, that's, um, in addition to that, that's the physical part of it. But in addition to that, we actually have a lot more built in behind that. And so you know, earlier, Tony was talking about you know, the, the TACMAN assays and you know, applied biosystems, the experience we've had in you know, life technologies incorporating all these different great brands. One of the great things we inherited from applied biosystems is the expertise uh, with our bioinformaticists, right? So we've been in the business uh, at the very beginning when uh, QPCR first came out. So we have literally over you know, a decade of experience with our bioinformaticists actually designing successful assays. So when you actually you know, look at a single tube and you buy it from applied, you know, I'm sorry, Life Technologies, what happens is that we went through a, a very large uh, bioinformatic gauntlet. So you know, we basically look at SNP masking, repeat masking. We apply algorithms uh, you know, based, based on our experience of designing assays for 10 years. So these computer algorithms basically can, basically can predict what is going to be a successful assay that's going to work in your hands. So there's a lot you know, of this actually that's involved and that the researcher doesn't necessarily see. And the important part of this message is that you don't have to do all of this. right? This was actually already done already by us in silico. Uh, in many cases, these assays have been wet tested. For example, all uh, human SNP assays, you know, when they go out the door, they've literally been functionally tested. So a research, a, a bench scientist um, in our labs has actually physically tested it against uh, you know, a selection of uh, you know, human DNA samples to ensure that we're actually getting performance. If it doesn't pass performance, then we, we don't release that assay. You know, we notify a customer and say, you know, sorry, we're going to redesign this. So there's actually a lot built in uh, to what's in that tube itself. Uh, now, one thing is that's great. You know, we went through all this effort to make great assays, but we have to make this easy for the researchers, you know, for you to actually find this on the website. And so what we do is you know, we have a, actually a collaboration with NCBI where we, you know, any new genome that's fully annotated, basically the information for it is linked on our website. And you can graphically, you know, in this case, like zoom in on, at the chromosome level. You can zoom in on the map and just get, scale in closer and closer. And then um, what you can do is you can actually see like the position of the actual assays for a given locus. And all these assays are reported down here. Now, the reason why this is important is because we want to make this simple and easy as possible. So if you're buying just a single assay for a single, you know, polymorphism or a transcript, you can just get that, or you can take this content and just easily populate it. Um, into different formats, into pre-plated formats. So that said about TACMAN assays, let's move on to a discussion of you know, what does a researcher want to do if they want to look at not just a single marker or dozens of markers, what if they want to look at hundreds of markers or potentially even thousands of markers and they want to use qPCR? There's always been this huge gap um, in this area here, what you're seeing on the, uh, the y-axis is basically the, the marker content. You know, how many genes or how many features are you looking at? Obviously, at the very, very high end, to get a full hypothesis-free look at a, a sample, uh, basically, you know, next generation sequencing is going to uh, achieve that for you. And that's what we have depicted on the top there. On the x-axis, going across, that's the number of samples that could be interrogated by a researcher. 
And uh, if you get into you know, areas of where you're trying to screen thousands of samples, tens of thousands, maybe potentially even hundreds of thousands of samples, think about, uh, for example, you know, if you're doing a genome-wide association study, right? So you have uh, patient <coughs> cohorts of 10,000, 100,000 even in, in these studies. So how can a researcher actually you know, engage, embark in the study by trying to use TACMAN chemistry but screen that many samples or screen you know, you know, larger numbers of markers? There's, there hasn't really been a platform to sit in this space, in this big space here and in this space over here until now. So that's, that's kind of what we call you know, mid-density. So when we talk about on the side the number of markers, mid-density is considered this area here. High density obviously is here. You know, this is an image of a microarray chip. You guys are all familiar with microarrays. Uh, you know, microarrays can have like hundreds of thousands or even like millions of probes you know, attached to the array. But what if a researcher doesn't need that? Right? You've already done your initial studies with uh, microarrays, and you need to go back and do you know, more focused validation. So instead of looking at you know, an entire transcriptome, you've identified the, the targets of interest. Let's say you're, you're, you're studying uh, you know, breast cancer. And you know, let's say there's 100 targets that you'd like to look at. Why would you go back and continue to interrogate your samples using a whole transcriptome approach? Because you've already determined that 99.9% .9 of the content of the array is uninformative, it's, it's of no interest to you. So instead what you're doing is you're picking a smaller subset and saying I would like to interrogate these further through qPCR. The limit in the past has been cost. You know, TACMAN chemistry, obviously, you know, it's, it's not necessarily cheap. Uh, you know, if you want to do qPCR you know, with you know, large numbers of markers or large numbers of samples, the cost gets prohibitive. So researchers have been limited to, instead of taking 200 markers, saying okay, well let's just pick maybe 10 or 15 that we can go after. So now with the advent of mid-density technology, and I'm showing you a, an image of an array there, uh, the array itself physically, I don't have any to hand out, but I'm just, I'm holding one right here in my hand. It's just basically the size of a microscope slide. So this uh, array technology then uh, will, would enable us to actually you know, tackle both uh, what we see here on the y-axis and the, uh, the x-axis. So because of that, what happened is Life Technologies acquired uh, OpenRay technology. We actually bought a company called Biotrove in early 2010. So uh, this actually is a much more mature platform. The you know, Biotrove system has been out in the market, I believe, since early 2006. And when uh, you know, applied biosystems at the time, before the, you know, the, the merger with Life Technologies, uh, what happened is that they recognized the potential for the system for high throughput genotyping. So our first customers really to adopt this uh, open array technology were all genotypers because they were, they were looking at larger numbers of markers and you know, huge you know, pop, uh, sa uh, population samples. So what happened is initially we adopted this for SNP genotypers. We said, okay, the array itself um, is very simple. If I describe it, uh, inside that array, there's 3,072 through holes. So you know, that a single array is, a, you know, is the equivalent of uh, you know, 32 96 well plates. So this enables you to do high throughput. Uh, this actually enables you to get the cost down dramatically because imagine uh, you know, the cost of a qPCR assay if you're doing, let's say, I don't know, a 20 microliter assay or, or, or even a 10 microliter assay. Let's compare that cost to what it would cost doing it inside one of these wells, which is actually a 33 nanoliter, nanoliter reaction. And so the cost savings that we see is actually due to the fact that we're using so much less master mix. Right, the master mix contains a polymerase and the, the DNTPs. So we're, we're using so little master mix in these reactions, that's why the cost goes down dramatically. So we get you know, cost benefits, sample throughput benefits, um, and also what we do is that we position inside all of these arrays, we already pre-spot your assays. So that's another advantage because imagine you know, if you're you know, working with hundreds of plates, uh, you know, a multi-month project, Maybe you have multiple labs cooperating together on a project, and now you're asking someone to go into the freezer and pull out of the freezer, you know, like 50 tubes, 100 tubes, 200 tubes, and you're trusting that researcher that when they're pipetting manually over and over and over again, that they're actually doing this without switching the assays. So think, think about, you know, the, the, the possibility of human error. So the other advantage here is that when we take these arrays, we take your content, you go to our website, as I showed you um, on that screenshot before, you uh, select the markers that you're interested in, and then we take that content and we pre-spot these arrays for you. 
So the assay is already fixed in position. So you're not, you're not adding the assays at this point. To describe the array a little bit more in general, uh, you know, how the sample is actually introduced in there is through a very simple process. It's through capillary action. So what happens is the surface of the array is hydrophobically treated. The interior of the through holes, uh, all 3,072, they're uh, hydrophilically treated. So what happens is when the sample then gets introduced into the array, it just it wicks the sample in. And I have a couple slides uh, demonstrating that uh, a little further. So this was the, the technology. Uh, this was the original system that we're showing you here. This is, it's called the NT Cycler, you know, open array NT Cycler. And um, the array itself, there's different formats. This is just an example here of, you know, let's say gene expression formats. So, you know, if the numbers, you know, that you're seeing on the bottom of the array basically uh, mean the number of markers that you're interrogating per, per panel times the number of samples that you can look at on a single array. And so as an example here on the far right, we're looking at 224 different TACMAN assay gene expression markers um, on a single array, and they're all spotted you know, sequentially in four squares, and that enables you to actually look at 12 samples simultaneously. So imagine trying to you know, you know, go to the freezer, take out 224 single tubes, right, and uh, do this uh, by hand. So it really simplifies the process. Of course, if you're, you know, you're not looking at large numbers of markers like this, you can get down to as few as 18 markers. We spot the 18 markers in triplicate. So you can quickly see by color you know, where we actually introduce all the samples on the array. Now this is just an example of what we have currently. There have been many requests from researchers. You know, they say, well, OK, this is great, but I have more than 224 markers, or you know, I don't really have this many. You know, I want to do lower than this. So we do have a custom process we can kind of work with researchers if you don't fit you know, within the, you know, the inventory uh, formats that we have. If you're a genotyper, uh, can I just see a raise of hands? Who's, who's involved in genotyping, SNP genotyping? OK. OK, there's more hands going up. OK, great. So if you're genotyping and you're interested in you know, spotting our SNP assays onto these arrays, the formats are very similar. Uh, they're slightly different in that you know, we actually enable you to add multiple samples per uh, square. These squares we actually call subarrays. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit further in upcoming slides. But we enable you to actually you know, go as few as uh, 16 SNP markers. And if that's the case, you can interrogate 144 samples in a single array. You, know, you can run multiple arrays per day. You can literally you know, process thousands, tens of thousands of data points uh, in a single day, as opposed to months. Those were the custom panels for gene expression and genotyping. This is where you know, you're, you're picking your content. You're telling us what you want. Now, what we also have uh, that you know, I think will be of, of interest to a lot of researchers are what we call these pathway panels. Curiously, like, what else is out there that I'm missing that's involved in this entire uh, you know, cancer pathway, let's say? Uh, may, you know, instead of just looking at the 10 or 12 that I think are interesting from uh, information I got from you know, doing research, let's just see what else is out there. What, what are other researchers looking at? Let's see if we can find any other connections. So we took that idea and said, OK, the open array layout is ideal for this, because we can actually make these pathway panels even larger. So what we did, and we have these already available, and we'll, we'll be adding more to this list, but here's a listing of let's, the human kinome panel. Uh, we have a human cancer panel, inflammation, stem cell panel uh, has been of interest to a lot of researchers. The stem cell panel is a collection of you know, 600 something uh, markers basically for plurip, uh, differentiation and pluripotency. So it was really helping a lot of researchers you know, screen their stem cells for stemness. Uh, trying to characterize um, induced pluripotent cell lines, embryonic cells. And uh, in addition to that, we have uh, in, uh, uh, signal transduction panels as well. With these inventory panels, what we have is a, a much larger format. So the array itself is physically the same. But what we did is, in, you know, obviously it's larger than that, the 224 that I showed you before. In order to fit you know, 600, 700, 800 of these markers on an entire panel, we fill up an entire square, like an entire section of the array. So in this case, uh, you know, like 25% of the array is devoted to a single sample. So you can basically interrogate, you know, f just a few samples, uh, you know, against a large number of markers. That's one comment we've gotten a lot from early adopters of this technology, is they said, you know, this, this, this technology is great, but the problem is I don't, it doesn't fit my numbers. 
you know, I don't have, uh, I can't meet your minimum order requirements for a custom panel. You know, you're asking me to order at least 10 of these arrays. Well, I don't have that many samples. I only have 50 samples. You know, you're asking me to order, you know, 200 samples worth. And so what this does the, with these inventory panels, it allowed researchers now to just order these individually. You just get a single, you know, two, three, four, five, whatever you need. So uh, we'll actually be adding considerably to this list. We just released these, you know, about six, seven months ago. We'll uh, be adding quite a bit more um, as, as the months go on. I'm depicting down here a, a, a genetic barcoding panel. This is a, a collaboration we did uh, with uh, University of Miami, where they discovered that, you know, with as few as 32 human SNPs, we could come up with a genetic barcode that could identify, a, you know, a patient sample. So we can not only determine the sex, but we can actually you know, identify that, okay, this sample is, is literally you, right? Uh, and then they also have like 64 and then 32 SNP panels as well. So these were actually released, and I think these would be of tremendous interest to anyone that's involved in you know, biorepository work, sample tracking of large, you know, large patient cohorts, trying to go back and validate and say, okay, you know, we know the sample is patient 654, you know, six on the list, you know, because we confirm it with the SNP genetic barcode. In addition to that, is anyone engaged in microRNA studies, microRNA profiling in either uh, human or not, not microarray, but microRNA? Well, if you were, uh, we have microRNA panels available on the OpenRay as well. And the reason why we thought this would be an ideal fit for OpenRay is that previously, when researchers were trying to profile our entire microRNA library, against our samples, uh, you know, we have a collection of 800, 750 uh, human microRNA and, and rodent microRNA markers. Uh, what they would do is they would use um, what I'm depicting here as microfluidic cards. Microfluidic cards have been used, I believe, for about six or seven years uh, by our customers. These are 3D four-well plates. They were very successful early on because we also did the same approach. We actually took the content, the TACMAN assays, and we spotted them inside the 384 wells. So they were completely contained. But the problem researchers had with this it, when they're doing microRNA studies is that they would have to run too many of these cards in order to you know, complete this project. And so the, the workflow was you know, kind of tedious. And uh, you know, if you had a smaller you know, project size, that, that would be fine. But if you know, researchers were literally looking at you know, dozens, you know, hundreds of targets, we thought instead of running multiple cards, we'll just spot the content because of the, the throughput capabilities onto the array itself. So we've been doing very well with the microRNA panels. Those were the assays that were spotted. Those are the different formats, right? I explained that you don't actually pipette manually the assays into the arrays. Now, what's missing from the reaction itself now? We have the assays in place. We're missing the sample, and we're mis missing the master mix. And we ex don't expect you, of course, to manually pipette that by hand into the, the little arrays either. Um, as far as I know, there's no multi-channel pipetters that can allow you to pipette 3,072 wells. So uh, what we have is we have an automated loading device. This is called the AccuFill system. That's what I have uh, depicted here in the top. The AccuFill device is just its a liquid handling deck. It's very simple. It comes along with the instrument. You just lift up the door. And then uh, there's a picture here of what's inside the, uh, the loading system. And it's essentially just you're looking at uh, four arrays for the open arrays lined up in position. There's a 3D four wall plate right here. It's hard to see because the plate is black, but there's a 3D four wall plate. That plate actually contains your uh, genomic DNA or your cDNA that's been prepared, and it's already mixed with uh, the, the master mix. So that's already in the 3D four wall plate, and you just position that 3D four wall plate inside the instrument. And so all this machine is doing is coming over, grabbing the pipette tips, it's grabbing 40 tips at a time, grabbing your samples, and then it's moving over here to one of the arrays. And then here's a, a zoomed in image of what's happening. There's 48 tips that are coming down together, and each of those tips is making contact with one of the subarrays. So if you think back to the, the colored schematic, you know, where you saw the different color blocks, each block is being, um, or the sample is being introduced one pipette at a time into the block. And if I zoom in here, this here is actually just one of those squares. There is a, uh, if, you, if you zoom in, this, this image again I showed earlier, but if you zoom in, there's 48 of these squares on the array itself. 
within each of those squares, there are 64 reactions. So, you know, 64 times 48, that's 3,072. What's happening is when the pipette tip comes down, it actually makes contact with the corner of one of those squares and then just simply glides in a serpentine fashion. It just goes back and forth and just introduces 33 nanoliters, 33 nanoliters, 33 nanoliters. And the loading is actually very precise. Uh, because it's capillary action, the, the volume uh, that's actually being introduced into the reactions is determined by the, the shape of the through hole. And so since the shape of the through hole defines that volume, we're getting very precise loading of 33 nanoliters plus or minus you know, one nanoliter. So the loading is very precise and it's automated. And that the loading of the array uh, takes this instrument about a minute. So if you think back again, okay, you know, how long would it have taken me to set up 32 96 volt plates by hand, you know, manually pipetting with a multi-channel pipetter, you know, and how many sources of error, how many you know, points of error could, could have been introduced then you really realize the potential of uh, a technology like this. What I'm showing you here uh, you know, in these, uh, these two images is, remember I said for genotyping, you could actually uh, spot multiple samples per subarray. So what happens then is uh, the, the instrument would just discard the pipette tips. It will go back and grab more pipette tips, go into different sample wells, and then come back in and just reload the other half of the subarray. So that way, instead of you know, just having 48 samples on an array, now all of a sudden you're looking at 96 samples per array. If you're going through this format right here, then basically you can look at as many as 144 samples. So the loading is very simple. And that's, that's basically all that, that's, you know, that comprises the reaction, right? The assay was already in position. We added the master mix with your sample, and that was done by this automated loading device. So there was really no hands-on introduction uh, for setting up this workflow. So, I want to like segue in and lead into the you know the, this new Quant Studio you know 12K Flex platform. So the reason why we came out with this technology or, or this single system is that before this <coughs> instrument was released, what we had was different formats right that were available. The TACMAC chemistry you know was available through single tubes. I explained the 96 well plates were available. Uh, these these are the fluidity cards. These are those 3D four well fluidity cards. All of these could be run on, uh, let's say, the 7900 real-time instrument. I don't know if you guys have those in your lab. This is the VS7. This is a, a newer real-time instrument that we have. This, uh, this instrument was very popular because of the flexibility. Right? You can actually see I'm, I'm showing multiple thermal cycling blocks next to this instrument. And the reason why it was popular is because a researcher can easily switch the blocks. So now you have a system that's uh, very versatile. You don't have to you know, buy a system and then later when the project scope increases, then have to adopt another platform. Now all you have to do is just simply place the block in there. And it takes about 30 seconds. So the limit, though, was that this system, this is called a VIA-7, was that this, the system could not do even higher mid-density sample throughput. It could not run the open arrays. In order to run the open arrays, we had a dedicated system, which was this, uh, the older open array NT cycler right here. So the idea, and of course this system, and I was explaining this to researchers outside, this system can only run open arrays. So what happened is that this platform, you know, if it's in a lab where this is all you're doing, you're just doing high throughput research all the time, you're screening large numbers of samples, well then that's fine. But the majority of researchers uh, basically didn't have projects of that size all the time. So what would happen is it, if you look out in the market for mid-density, high sample throughput platforms, us and competitors, what would happen is that you'd see platforms that cost, you know, in U.S. dollars, you know, $200,000, $240,000, and then a researcher would say, okay, well, we bought this platform, you know, we, we got the grant money, and wow, this thing has collected dust now for about four or five months, six months, or even a year. You know, you get excited, you buy the platform, you run a project, and then the project's finished, right, in a couple days. Uh, and then the rest of the time, this machine's collecting dust. So, you know, people saw that as a problem. We saw this as a problem right away. So the idea behind this is that let's go ahead and launch into a new platform, which can actually can run all of those formats. So we can say that this is our, you know, a universal platform. This is our newest, uh, you know, in the line of qPCR instruments. It's the latest development after, you know, 10, 12 years of qPCR um, instrument. Uh, engineering and, and research that we can release something that is truly unique in the market. Uh, there's no other competitor that can say that they have something they can do 
uh, everything from you know a single tube all the way to you know a high throughput you know 3072 reactions right so this is an image of the new uh, quantity we actually announced this uh, at the end of 2011 at um, um, ASHG uh, so we, we, we announced this uh, it was a big splash you know marketing campaign to release this and uh, these instruments have actually been going out and selling now since uh, the beginning of the year click that uh oh okay uh, I'll just I don't want to bore you too much with you know like all the little details of the instrument but just briefly if um, let me back up real quick. If you look at the front of the instrument, and if you saw the actual instrument that was out there in, in the lobby, you'll notice that there's a uh, there's an LED screen, uh, LCD screen on the front. And uh, what was really nice about this is that you could actually look at your um, runs in real time, and so you could see this up on the touch screen. So you could control the instrument through the touch screen without a computer. You can run it with a computer. You can run it without the computer. Um, you can remote uh, monitor the uh, the runs remotely. Uh, you could actually see the amplification plots on the screen itself. So it just, it, we just basically took all the comments in the features uh, that we saw like in, in, all the, in the progression of real-time instrumentation over the last decade and tried to put everything into this platform uh, that researchers said they wanted. So the, the, like I said, the instrument itself can run without a computer. So what we have is we have onboard um, storage on, on the system. So you can actually store up to you know, hundreds of runs on the system, there's a flash drive on there where you can you know, store the data um, and, and ch get it off there later. You can actually program experimental files, you know, put that information on a, a USB stick, and then you can go in and just plug it into the instrument and then and run it like that. So um, a lot of versatility, and with the system also, you can basically set up a run, and then you can just go home. And then you can have the machine email you the data uh, to your house, <laughs> so you can stay up late at night in front of your computer uh, looking at uh, the data that was generated without, without waiting and sitting by the machine uh, the whole time. The, um, one of the things that we found out right away uh, that was needed it was the illumination source. So there's a lot of different real-time instruments out there that use different illumination strategies. Of course, even within life technologies, if you look at all the instruments, uh, that Tony introduced earlier in the presentation. We use a variety of light sources. We use L, you know, focus LED, uh, focus wavelength LED lights. We use broad spectrum halogen bulbs. Uh, so what we did figured out actually is that there's a new generation of uh, super bright LED uh, lights that are out there now. So these are the same you know, LED lights that you're starting to see in you know, like football stadiums, right? So uh, these are really super bright uniform lights. And this brighter LED basically allowed us to have the resolution of not only looking at, you know, let's say a single assay or single well, but also going all the way up to the open array itself. So we took this LED technology, incorporated it into this new system, and then with the LED, uh, we're actually able to illuminate the fluorophores that are of most interest to us. The, uh, the FAM and the VIC fluorophore, of course, these are FAMs, used, it's used in all of our TACMAN assays for gene expression, microRNA profiling. FAM and VIC are used if you're doing biallelic discrimination using our SNP assays. But in addition to, and you'll see here that the, the LED spectrum is actually here in blue as compared to the halogen bulb, uh, which is used in other systems. It's, you know, it's longer wavelength. So it wouldn't really excite the, uh, the, the FAM and VIC fluorophores as well in these tiny 33 nanoliter reactions. We found that while it was sufficient to illuminate something in a 3D four wall plate, it just simply didn't work when you're getting into nanoliter volumes. It didn't work as well. It, we, we needed to improve the sensitivity of the system. So we achieved that through this you know, next ger generation super bright LED system. Now, that's FAM and VIC, but what about researchers that are looking at longer wavelength dyes? You know, are you sacrificing anything by not having that you know, halogen bulb? Um, and the answer is no. This system is a multiplexing system. It can actually interrogate dyes at short wavelength, you know, 480 nanometers all the way up to 630, 700 nanometers. So if you're looking at longer wavelength dyes, if you're truly interested in multiplexing targets, you like to, you know, look at three or four, let's say, you know, viral assays simultaneously within the same reaction, and you want to go through the work of optimizing and trying to get the primers to actually cooperate and work together, well then that's fine. The, the, the instrument is set up already to enable multiplexing. You can look at as many as five targets simultaneously. 
And the way we achieve this is actually, uh, you know, from an engineering standpoint, is because we use uh, decoupled excitation and emission filters. So using these filters together with that super bright LED, we're actually able to illuminate dyes of all, you know, all wavelengths and then accommodate all the different uh, formats on the system. So it's a combination of those two that uh, enable us to do that. And just an example here, just showing you in a true multiplexing run. If you're looking at five targets, you know, we have five genes that we're looking at with assays, all labeled with different fluorophores. Uh, you know, what you're seeing at the, in, in the light blue, this you know, low amplification plot, obviously this wasn't excited as well uh, because this was longer wavelength. However, we got good data, right? We got excellent data because we don't care about the, the actual amplitude of that plot. That's irrelevant because we know in real-time PCR, the data actually is all derived within the exponential phase of amplification. So we got perfect data um, from a five-plex experiment here. So when we announce or you know, release a new instrument like this, we of course have to do internal validations. We have to convince researchers that not only does our instrument uh, you know, say what, what we say it does, we have to demonstrate it by benchmarking it, comparing it to you know, our other systems, comparing across all block types. We've done a lot of internal R&D studies uh, showing this data, you know, demonstrating not only is this machine you know, as good, but it's actually better. So just a brief overview, again, a reminder that this is not a, a niche platform. It's not uh, just a system that runs you know, high throughput open array. This is a system that will run 96 well, 3D4 well, uh, you know, TACMAN array, these are the microfluidic blocks, TACMAN array card blocks, and it does it equally well. So we just, you know, do, this is standard, you know, all, you know, vendors in the field will do this. They'll take a, a sample, like let's say a plasmid, and then they'll do a tenfold dilution series of that. And the point of this is to de demonstrate full dynamic range of the platform. So by doing this, we just took plasmid uh, DNA and we basically just went all the way from you know, low copy numbers, you know, as few as like 10 or five copies, and we do a tenfold increase across to show you that we're actually getting reproducible amplification and that the PCR efficiency is constant uh, throughout that entire dynamic range. Now this is data of the actual open array itself, and the reason why I show this is because there's, there's a lot of confusion sometimes with interpreting CT values. So if you look at a cycle threshold value on a traditional real-time system, for those of you that have done you know, a lot of qPCR, you know, we know that typically you know, if you're talking about a single copy, mathematically you know, a, co a single copy of a template would probably occur at around you know, 37, 36, 37, 38 PCR cycles. Uh, before it actually gives a CT signal. That, of course, is dependent on, you know, what, you know, what the assay is, what your sample, you know, uh, what's actually in the master mix, uh, what the rise is above baseline fluorescence, and also where you set the threshold to determine that CT value. And the CT value is what you're seeing here uh, depicted uh, in the y-axis. So the confusion arises from the fact that when you move into nanoliter size reactions, those numbers actually shift dramatically. So if you tell a customer, okay, you know, a single copy of, uh, in a well is interrogating and de demonstrating a CT value of, you know, let's say, 37 on a traditional real-time system, you're not going to see the same thing in a nanoliter environment because the volumes are much, lar uh, much smaller and you have a much smaller window of ampli amplification rise above the baseline. And so what happens is the CT if you think in terms of molecules per uh, you know, volume, the CT number is actually shifted dramatically to the left. So what would be you know, 35 cycles, let's say, in a, real -time, a traditional real-time system would actually occur at around 25 cycles. So that's one thing to consider, and that's no big deal, because remember, the CT value itself is an arbitrary number. There's no meaning in that CT value unless you actually compare it relatively to another reference sample or a reference marker. So everything has shifted dramatically. So what we do here is we just demonstrate that yes, even with the open array, we're able to achieve a very good dynamic range. We cannot match uh, what we showed in the previous slide, which is you know, nine orders of magnitude, right? It's just simply, it's not a limitation of the machine, it's a limitation of the volume of the reaction itself. We just simply can't exceed uh, seven logs here. And of course, what's happening in this instance, this is the lowest dilution point. This is probably at around, let's say, a, 100 copies, 50 copies of uh, target input. While you could actually get very consistent CT values you know, using a 20 microliter reaction, when you get into nanoliter reaction environments, what happens is we run into a problem that is independent of the machine itself, 
It's Poisson distribution. So it's just simply Poisson. We can't control the number of copies that are reproducibly being introduced into nanoliter reactions. Because what's happening is, obviously, you're, you're just getting 50 copies in there once. And then in the replicate, you're probably adding maybe 20. Yeah, it's, it's bouncing around quite a bit. And that's what you're seeing here. So just to back up again, if, I, you know, if we look at the overall workflow of, of OpenRay uh, on the system, what happens basically outside of your hands is this, right? This is what we do at Life Technologies. You take the assays like I described. We actually manuf These are the same assays that we would manufacture as single tubes. Uh, it goes through the same design process. We take all these assays, let's say hundreds of markers that you're interested in, we spot those onto the arrays. So when the researcher receives the array out of the freezer, it has your content. This part down, this part down here is actually what you're doing in the lab. This is the actual loading part of the arrays and also the, the actual run and then the analysis of, of the data. Once you actually load the array with that system, the only hands-on part here is that you're simply clamping the array itself, you're, you have to contain the array. Because remember, the array is open, right? Uh, it's, it, we, we call those in through holes because you can literally look through the array. And we call these open arrays because you can literally look, if you hold it up to the light, you can see straight through. We have punctured you know, 3,072 holes in there. So how do you actually contain this 33 nanoliter reaction in there? Well, and how do you actually thermal cycle? Can you imagine you know, going up to 95 degrees with this open array with only 33 nanoliters of fluid? You know, what would happen literally within the first couple seconds is you just <laughs> you know, evaporate everything in that reaction. So what we have to do is we have to take the array and seal it inside a, a cassette. So it's a glass case. The glass case then is filled with immersion fluid. These, this immersion fluid is you know, sim similar to mineral oil. It's not mineral oil, but it's similar. But we, we fill up that case with a liquid solution. This is not um, aqueous. It's not aqueous. It's an oil. So what happens is now you have the array with the aqueous reactions. It's sandwiched between two layers of oil. So you have oil on top, oil on the bottom. So of course, uh, what happens then is the entire case, along with you know, the glass, the immersion oil, the stainless steel array, the assay, all of that gets thermal cycled up and down, up and down together. And so because of that, you know, we get asked a lot, okay, what, is, what are the cycling times? You know, can I actually run a, uh, a really fast qPCR reaction like I would traditionally on a regular instrument? You know, can I do 40 cycles of PCR in 35 minutes or 45 minutes? The answer is no, because a thermal transfer going across the glass to the oil into the stainless steel array just takes longer. So the cycling times are a little bit longer. Not much longer. For gene expression runs, our cycling is about two hours and 10 minutes. So it's still not really that, you know, that long. For genotyping, we like to actually go a little bit further, optimize our protocols for four hours for uh, genotyping runs. But uh, what happens is after you've actually loaded the, um, the oil into the glass case itself, you just take the glass case and you can load up to four of these arrays into the instrument. And that's what you're seeing uh, down here in the bottom right. Uh, there's the side arm of the machine is opening, and you can load a single array. Remember, this is 3,072 reactions, or you can load four arrays. Now you're up to 12,000 reactions. So now, if you think of the name Quant Studio 12K, 12,000, you know, where did this number come from? It came from the fact that we can actually run four of these arrays simultaneously. You can get 12,000 data points of qPCR uh, in a single run within two hours and 10 minutes. Uh, so in two hours and 10 minutes, you could accomplish the equivalent of maybe two or three months worth of work. This illustrates a little bit better, uh, just showing you three to four wall plates that are stacked up here. The single array, if you're doing gene expression, mathematically, you know, if you, whoever's quick in math, you'll say, okay, 3,072. That's not equal to seven three to four wall plates. That's actually equal to three, uh, I'm sorry, eight three to four wall plates. All right, that's true. Uh, but for gene expression, there's uh, certain through holes that we actually don't use. We don't spot assays into them. And so mathematically, for gene expression, it breaks down to seven of these 3D4 well plates. Or you could look at it as you know, 28 96 well plates are the equivalent of a single one of these arrays. A lot of throughput. The uh, throughput is achieved. It's illustrated better, I think, here. So if we say this is a single instrument, this is a single researcher running this project. Um, 
with you know, one machine, basically you could come in at nine o'clock, basically load up four of these arrays. Remember that the, the, green, the green section of this graph, right, this is, just, this is the machine doing the cycling. You're not doing anything at this point. You're, you're on the internet, you know, Googling things. So basically what happens is the, the workflow is just this part right here. It's just 15, 20 minutes of preparing the array, you know, setting up the machine, so forth. So there's, uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of downtime where the machine's doing all the work. So that's why this is a very easy and doable uh, you know, workflow for a single person. You know, a lot of times we get accused of presenting something on screen that's not realistically you know, achievable in the lab. You know, we got someone that's experienced for a year doing something and this is what we can do. Now, now you go do it. But um, in reality, I mean, the workflow is so simple that you know, I, I, this, this really is achievable. So a single person you know, runs 16 arrays per day. That's 43,000 data points if you're uh, doing qPCR. If you're doing genotyping, um, just look at the top half of the screen first. If you're genotyping, uh, what happens is that you can actually, because the run times are longer, uh, you run four at a time. You can basically run 12 open array plates. That's 36,000 genotypes that you could interrogate in a single day. Now, you know, for even high throughput genotypers, if you want to increase this further, you say, you know, 36,000, that's not enough for me. I need more than this. Well, if that's the case, uh, then we have these offline, this is just our standard 9700 uh, thermal cycle. I've had these out for a number of years. Researchers can actually cycle these arrays offline, so off the machine itself. Because remember, for genotyping, we're not really capturing qPCR data in real time. Right? Traditional genotypers, you just amplify, and then you do endpoint detection. Right? So you don't need the machine to be using the, you know, the uh, detecting fluorescence at every cycle. So that allows you to actually run up to eight arrays in a single 9700, just do regular PCR. And then when you're finished, take those arrays and put them into the instrument and just read. Use the machine as a reader, fluorescence reader. And it only takes five minutes to read an array. So I'm just showing you an example here that, you know, if, let's say you had two of these 9700 sitting there in the lab. You can run 16 at a time. Uh, so that means a single researcher with very little hands-on could run 32 of these arrays uh, in a genotyping setting. And that's uh, almost 100,000 reactions. So these are, you know, realistic numbers. Is, is anyone impressed yet? <laughs> Um, and for even higher throughput. So you're saying, okay, you know what, that's, that's great, but I really have higher throughput needs. You know, I work for uh, an ag bio company, and we're screening seed lots. And you know what, I have to screen you know, tens of thousands of seeds uh, on a weekly basis against you know, hundreds of SNP markers. Uh, everything you showed me is great, but I need even higher throughput. So we have this uh, twister arm. It's a robotic device that sits next to the machine. What this allows you to do is uh, stack a whole bunch of plates uh, together, and then the machine just automatically grabs a plate, puts it in the machine, does the run, takes the plate out, grabs another one. So it just does this all night long. So you don't even have to come back to work the next day. You can stay at home because the machine will send you the data, right? It emails the data to your, <laughs> to your house. <laughs> so this is even higher throughput. And we, we calculate it if you're doing genotyping, for example, you can actually get up to 2 million data points, 2 million genotypes if you stack up, um, you can stack up to 55 of these, you know, times four, so hundreds of arrays. Let's talk a little bit about the software features. Um, this is very important, you know, because I talked about the hardware, what's so great about, you know, the way the machine works. All that's pointless if you can't make a machine user-friendly. You have to make it easy for the customer to interpret and understand. Admittedly, some of our older instruments were <laughs> a little, you know, hard to decipher uh, in terms of the software. So we really worked on eliminating that bottleneck uh, for, uh, for the researcher. So we came out with a software uh, you know, platform that it should be intuitive. Should, you know, let's say the, our field application scientists came and trained you, and then you, know, you were distracted on other projects for a while. And then you come back two months later, you forgot everything that you learned in the training. Well, we designed software so that someone could come up and just figure it out on their own. You know, and, or, you know, worst case scenario, you pick up the phone, call tech support, and just, you know, hey, walk me through this. But it should be very easy to understand and very easy to figure out. You shouldn't have to have someone come back out and retrain you, because um, that's a big, you know, bottleneck to your research. It slows you down. So basically, we have this new software uh, that basically um, had a lot of users test, provide us feedback. We did is we um, allowed the ability to actually have multiple software packages 
uh, for you know, gene, gene expression, digital PCR genotyping, uh, you know, high resolution melt analysis, all this stuff uh, were separate software packages, but we said we have to make this simple. We have to incorporate this all into one software framework. So we actually have all these um, enabled uh, in the software itself, and it's actually built in. So this is just basically the basics of the software for the instrument, and then all those different software packages that I just showed you on the previous slide, all those can actually be automatically incorporated and built into the software. So you don't have to close a screen and go somewhere else on the desktop and look for another program or export data, move things back and forth. It's actually all built into the same framework. And as an example here, this is just um, you know, the Expression Suite software that's built in, very easily accessible. Expression Suite software, the really nice features of this um, are that we had a lot of tools built in for you know, correlation plots, you know, volcano plots, looking at p-values and correlations, heat maps, uh, basically for screen. This is very important because imagine when you're you know, looking at, you know, let's say, hundreds of targets simultaneously right, across dozens of samples. Are you going to one by one click your mouse and look at the amplification plot one by one by one? Right? That gets incredibly tedious. Uh, the whole point of looking at you know, large sets of biomarkers is to actually get a, a profile. Right? So we have heat maps built into the software where you can just do a very quick heat map analysis and uh, you know, allow the software to actually segre segregate all your samples. For genotypers, uh, the genotyping software is also built in. Oh, by the way, so this software, the previous software, this is free software. So this is downloadable uh, off of our website. And the nice thing is that, you know, yes, the software, you know, is part of the Quant Studio instrument package. But if you don't have the Quant Studio system, but you have another applied biosystems system already in your, in your lab, you can take full advantage of the software. This is free software. So gene expression is downloadable. You can actually look at all the data from your other applied biosystems or life technologies instruments that you have in your lab and analyze the data using our newest you know, state-of-the-art you know, analysis package. And this is free software for everyone to download off the web. Uh, what we can't help you with is if you're you know, using a BioRad machine <laughs> or, or Roche or somebody else. There's workarounds, but we won't go out of our way to help you too much. <laughs> This is an important feature because this was actually a, a customer of mine back in San Diego. It was a biotech company that had been using our 7900 instrument for years. And they said, uh, and they're big genotypers. And uh, they said one of the limitations that they saw was that when doing traditional genotyping, remember I described that genotypers just look at endpoint data, right? They thermal cycle and they basically just arrive at an allelic uh, discrimination plot, a cluster plot, or a Cartesian plot. So what happens is basically these are obviously no template controls, and you're getting two population groups showing up here. Right? So you get a group in green, and then you have a group in red that are showing up as two populations. Now the problem with this is that if you look closer into the green cluster, you'll actually see two separate subclusters, very distinct subclusters. However, the algorithm, the software, is actually defining that as a single population, a lily population, because of the proximity. What this, soft, this new Quant Studio system enables you to do is actually option, if you want, to do genotyping with real-time capability built into the run. So not only would you just run it and then just image at the end, you have the option of actually looking at fluorescence at every cycle. So then this allows you to go back and trace the fluorescence as it migrates backwards in time. So what this allows you to do is you don't have to go back and rerun the experiment and say, OK, well, we tried 40 cycles this time. Let's go to 35 cycles, or let's try 30 cycles. You know, a lot of different assays perform optimally at different PCR cycles. Some have to go all the way to 50. So what this new software allows you to do is just run it once, do 50 cycles on all of your different SNP assays, and then instead of physically going back and reproducing the data and just modifying it, all you're doing is you're marching backwards in the software itself, because the data was already collected. So if you see the traces, the algorithm um, and the user can actually go back and manually call this as well. They can go back and clearly see that this original cluster, which appeared to be um, a single allelic population, actually migrated completely differently. And so this is the end result. You identify this as a you know, completely different group. 
Obviously, you know, we would expect if there was a true homozygous population for one allele, if it was really beautiful, you'd expect it to appear actually over here, right? But that's not the case with all assays. Some, some assays, they just tend to blend together a little bit just because you ran too many cycles. So this enables you to do that. So this was actually one of, our, uh, one of my customers in San Diego that really uh, you know, called for this, asked for this to be built into the new software. And since we incorporated this into the software, it's, it's, it's been incredible, uh, the response from all the genotypers now. They see this and they're like, this is, you know, this is amazing. We never had the ability to do this before. I'll briefly uh, just touch on applications. Now, obviously, I'm not testing your eyesight. I, I, I know you can't see this. Um, what I'm attempting to do here is just show you some screen, recent screenshots of uh, posters that were presented either AACR, um, ASHG. Um, there's an upcoming um, American Society of Molecular Pathologists, AMP, that's coming up in October. So I'll show you a poster there. Um, but this is like early work here where basically with our researchers, um, groups were just studying, um, you know, or you're studying the use of open rate technology for various applications. So in this case, uh, we're basically looking at uh, testing of uh, biofilms, water sample testing. So the ability to actually screen uh, very quickly uh, water samples for uh, different bacteria, uh, you know, pathogen particles located. And the reason why I'm not zooming in on all this is because there's nothing novel here. Remember, this system, although the novelty is that it's you know, in this array format, it's a 33 nanoliter reaction, that's the end of the novelty, right? The rest of this is qPCR. So the way the data is interpreted uh, and collected, it's still qPCR. So that's why I'm not going to bore you with all the details, um, because this is you know, no different from if someone had done this uh, in a traditional real-time system. The power of this was the throughput, the ability to actually you know, screen large numbers of samples quickly um, and get an answer uh, very quickly. This is a poster uh, that was presented um, at ASHG. This is uh, basically um, our researchers at, at Carlsbad headquarters in California, where we, have, we set up this year a special stem cell applications lab. Uh, it's a lab where basically there, it's a dedicated team focused on you know, all areas of stem cell research, you know, from at the a cellular level all the way to you know, transcriptome profiling. So they you know, obviously are adopting this technology as well, incorporating it into their labs and demonstrating data. So this has been, uh, what they're trying to show here is that it allows stem cell researchers to go back to their cultures and just quickly characterize um, even at different passages um, their, their cultures. So they're looking at induced pluripotent stem cells, embryonic stem cells, and just using this open array technology as, as, a, as a screening tool basically to, uh, to characterize. And what they did is uh, they did a PCA analysis, principal component analysis, to simply just compare the results, you know, what, what does it look like with microarray analysis, which is a lot more cumbersome and tedious. Can we achieve the same answer using a very quick and fast qPCR methodology on the open array? And yes, they were. They basically achieved, um, you know, pretty much the same answer there. And again, I'm still testing your eyesight here <laughs> with more, more posters. Uh, but this, this is a recent poster, actually, uh, with a collaboration with the FDA um, back in the States. So with our company and the FDA, uh, we're basically just uh, you know, using the title is somewhat misleading. It says multiplex uh, analysis of pathogens. So they're not, we're not actually multiplexing the assays within the wells. They're saying multiplex in the sense that we can do the equivalent of multiplexing but just basically just do these as single-plex assays in a high-throughput format. So it basically en enables us to, let's say, you know, spatially multiplex, you know, geographically multiplex on the array, you know, without having to actually try to test all these different assays out and get them to work together. So they, you know, the FDA always has this panel of, you know, like 30-something potential, uh, you know, threatening pathogens, and that, that list is changing all the time with different strains and, and variants. But uh, they said, okay, you know, with the open rate technology, we can quickly just come up with easy panels to detect all these pathogens and just use it as a screening panel for routine studies and analysis. And again, all this information here, which is so tiny that you can't see it, this is just standard you know, qPCR um, results, so I'm not getting into that. And admit it, I can't even read this. <laughs> This is, uh, this is work uh, that a group did um, at, um, at uh, basically um, um, North Shore um, uh, uh, Cancer Center in, in Hempstead, New York. Uh, it's a recent poster where they're looking at ovarian cancer. And so they, what, what they were trying to do here is basically show um, in ovarian cancer if they could come up with a predictive gene signature for survival. 
uh, survival after surgery and, and chemotherapy. And what they found is they found a 90% correlation, uh, actually using this technology, they were looking at microRNA profiles in, in plasma. So if they could actually just look at the circulating microRNA levels in blood, could they actually come up with a, a predictive um, signature, gene expression, or microRNA signature uh, predicting survival rate? And uh, they were very successful in the early phase of the study uh, using this, th those microRNA panels that I showed you early in the talk. Uh, they used those, and they actually found in some cases, like MIR, MIR 16 had an 80-fold increase um, in expression values for uh, the population group that exhibited, you know, like very high, or, you know, full survival um, five years after uh, surgery and chemotherapy. So, uh, and there was a number of other mirrors as well that showed, you know, 40-fold expression <laughs> increases, 20-fold expression increases. So very, very powerful and quick to use, um, screening tool. And they're actually, they work with us on this because uh, the, one of the initial requirements for the protocol was that we required about 100 to 200 nanograms of starting RNA material. And so that's a lot, you know, when you're asking, you know, trying to interrogate small sample sizes or you have, you know, biopsied samples or, you know, you just basically have very little, uh, let's say, fluid to work with. So we have, you know, optimized a protocol where you can actually, you know, use, using a pre-amplification strategy, you can use very, very, very low levels of uh, input material and still uh, preserve the expression um, relationship without bias. So, um, and, you know, in previous poster, I showed you that there's a stem cell applications lab at uh, Carlsbad. They've actually already demonstrated that you know we can get down a single cell uh, gene expression detection levels by using this preamplification method. Preamplification method has been you know used and well established in the literature now. Uh, I'd say going back five or six years. So as long as you keep the PCR cycles to a minimum during the preamplification, you basically avoid the uh, the bias that gets introduced uh, through exponential. PCR. You know, if you do too many cycles, of course, you will eventually always in introduce bias. But we figured out a very clever way of minimizing that and preserving that gene signature. This uh, poster uh, basically, although small, you can pretty much look at the middle and figure out what the message here is. Um, it's correlation analysis, correlation plots, very high R squared values. This is a group uh, that I work with at Cedar Sinai uh, Medical Center uh, in, in Los Angeles. And the reason they actually included me on this poster as an author, um, and they'll be publishing uh, later this year as well. And uh, the reason why I, you know, I like showing this poster is because they were skeptics of this preamplification method. You know, no, we don't want to do preamplification. We read, we heard from others it introduces PCR bias. We don't want to do this. So we actually, you know, convinced them by <laughs> essentially doing the study for them <laughs> for free. Um, Basically, by you know, they, they provided us samples, and uh, there was two very important things they wanted to answer. One, do we trust the person at Life Technologies that said preamp will not introduce bias? So they tested that, and they also wanted to know, more importantly, can we compare FFP, so formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples, can we compare that back to their matched frozen pristine samples and still arrive at the same signature? Do we get the same correlation? And to embark on the study, there was so many different comparisons that they did. They actually compared different reverse transcription methodologies. They used random priming, gene-specific priming, oligo-DT priming. They had us design special assays for the FFP material because, as you know, you know FFP samples are extremely degraded. Uh, if you use you know large amplicons, you know the amplification efficiency drops down uh, dramatically. So we designed very short amplicons for them. The end result of all of this is they, they saw a very, very high correlation between uh, using small amplicon designs on their FFP sample set compared to the fresh frozen. That was very important for them. And then also they were able to show that with pre-amplification, they were able to use very little of their precious patient material. They could get away with using you know, tenfold, hundredfold less material using this amplification approach and still arrive at correlation, you know, a very high correlation to, the, uh, to what they're expecting. So that was the message here. This is a very thorough uh, analysis or, or, or a testing of, uh, of the technology itself and our, our preamplification method. Let me uh, jump off here a little bit and talk about digital PCR. And uh, the reason why I want to talk about, first of all, who's, who's familiar with digital PCR? Has anyone heard of digital? Nobody? 
Okay, so digital PCR is something relatively new, and it's something that's getting a lot of, a lot of buzz, a lot of interest in the, in the research community. And uh, the funny thing is digital PCR is actually was first described um, in, in proceedings in 1990. The first paper describing digital PCR was back then. No one really adopted it. Uh, and no one thought it was something that was really usable. You know, this is, you know, okay, interesting paper, great. But it's not something we can actually use and apply in our lab and in our research. And so the reason why is because in order for digital PCR to be effective, you need a large, large number of replicates. So what digital PCR basically is, is taking a sample and basically taking that same sample. Now this sample has your, your, your material, your, you know, your cDNA or your, your genomic DNA. It has your master mix. It has the assay of whatever target you're trying to interrogate. It has everything pre-mixed in there. All you're doing in digital PCR, you're saying, let's take this material and distribute it. Let's distribute it across as many wells as we possibly can. And so the idea behind that is that if we dilute the sample across enough wells, eventually what's going to happen is we're going to get a single copies of that template by itself in that reaction vessel. So now we've isolated individual copies. So that's the entire principle behind digital PCR. And so what that enables us to do is to get an absolute measurement or an absolute count of how many copies of that target you have in your sample. So you know the obvious, you know, thought is, okay, if I'm trying to quantitate, let's say, viral copies, how many copies of HIV you know, does this patient have circulating in their blood? Well, you want to get an absolute count of that. So in order to get an absolute count, we can partition, distribute, partition copies into their own wells. And so if you think of Poisson distribution, Poisson math, right? So we get to a point where you dilute enough. How do you get to you know, one copy as opposed to you know, five copies or 10 copies? When you dilute enough, you're eventually going to get so many negative wells, like empty wells light up. And that's fine. That's fine. We actually want a large number of negative wells. Because when we have a large number of negatives, we know that we're getting into that Poisson range of, of, of distribution. And that we can you know, reasonably be uh, assured that the wells that do light up positive have a single copy in there. And so all the machine is doing at this point is just counting the number of wells that lit up on the array versus the number of wells that are not lit up. And from that number, that count, it's going back and inferring how many copies you have. That's the principle of digital PCR. And it's an extremely simple technique. Digital PCR can literally be done tomorrow by every single one of you in the lab um, using a 3D 4-wheel plate or a 96-wheel plate. But as I said, the limitation there is that you don't have enough wells for this to be really effective. Because right? what's going to happen is, how do you know that if you take your sample and you split it across 96, that you really are going to get single copies in there, right? You actually may end up with a thousand copies in a well, <laughs> a thousand copies in the next well. So you have to do a lot of work in pre-diluting your sample so that it actually fits into the dynamic range of whatever vessel or plate you're using, you know, 96 wells or 3D4 wells. So in reality, digital PCR was just not very applicable, um, you know, until now when we've released these mid-density arrays, you know, with the ability to actually distribute that sample across 3,000 wells, right? So you just gain an order of magnitude. And that's basically digital PCR, uh, an overview description. The uses of digital PCR obviously is, you know, you know, viral quantitation, trying to ascertain true copy number. So if you're looking at copies of a gene and comparing patient A to patient B, and let's say, you know, you, it, it, the resolution of qPCR stops at, let's say, like two-fold discrimination. Let's say, you know, you have four copies of a gene, um, an HIV susceptibility gene in one sample, or in one patient, and then you have five copies in another patient. That's a 20% difference. If you mathematically think back to a 20% difference in copies, how that would look uh, in qPCR, the amplification plots would be right on top of each other, practically, right? Mathematically, I think that's, they're, they're 0.3 cycles apart. So you can't really, you know, with confidence say that there's a true 20% you know, difference in copy levels. That's where digital PCR can actually come in. Um, studying like copy number variation at a much higher level. You can actually get down to you know, about 10% differentiation. So if someone had 10 copies and then the other person had nine copies of a gene, you'd never be able to do that with qPCR. But with digital PCR, um, it's been demonstrated. So in a lot of cases, uh, we're seeing this pop up here as well. So researchers are looking at low transcript levels, 
low copies of transcript, and they're getting CT values that are coming up very, very late on their traditional QPCR system. And they're not really sure what that number means. Right? So something came up at 34. Well, we tried to reproduce that, and the replicates show up at either nothing or you know, like at 30. What's going on here? You know, we're running into Poisson uh, mathematics again. Uh, so what happens is with digital PCR, you can actually take each individual sample and just get an accurate count rather than just you know, guessing, OK, well, we're, we're plus or minus two cycles here you know, with a, 30, a CT value of 34. So this is a very uh, precise method of quantitation or a technique for quantitation. To illustrate that so you just kind of understand it better, uh, just, this is an example of just taking a virus Remember, this could be any template, really. I mean, this could be, you know, let's say, you know, DNA extracted from soybean. We're basically just trying to interrogate, you know, any, any you know, given locus. So what they did in this case is they just took an array and they did a serial dilution. They did a two-fold serial dilution of uh, this uh, BK, BK2 viral standard uh, that we have. And basically, they wanted to be able to determine if they could get an accurate count of how many copies of this target uh, do we actually have per microliter. And so. Uh, you know, don't focus on the numbers here, but if you just look up here on the left-hand side, we obviously have a problem, right? What I said before was that in order for digital PCR to work, you have to start seeing negative wells, you know, no copies show up in order to be confident in this. What's happening in, the, in this case and over here is that we're just oversaturated. We, we distributed the sample across those subarrays, but we just ended up with so many, you know, copies per well. There's not enough negatives. There's no way that we can really go in to, with absolute certainty and say, okay, this was, you know, 1,000 copies versus, you know, five copies, right, Tra using traditional endpoint digital PCR approach. So this is actually the range of where uh, the system will work because now you can go in and actually get an accurate count, and we tr determined, you know, for these different dilutions that, you know, we, we had about 15,000 co uh, 15, copies uh, per microliter. And uh, this was actually pretty good because these were viral standards that we generate uh, through our, our other side of the business. It's called Acrometrics. Uh, you know, they generate uh, standards of all sorts, and that's, they're all part of life technologies as well. So we already had a, a good idea of what the copy count should have been um, in this. So we just did this as a, as a proof of principle. So um, I described earlier about low full copy number determination. I think this illustrates here uh, pretty well. If you're looking at trying to interrogate, uh, you know, like copy, copy changes, let's say, you know, like four to five, five to six, six copies versus seven copies, the percentage chain gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The reason why I'm showing this is because for those of you that are interested in, you know, studying, you know, copy number variation in genomes, we actually have an, a different line of TACMAN assays uh, they're, they're called TACMAN copy number assays. So it's a completely different line that, uh, of assays we developed that worked actually extremely well through traditional qPCR. Uh, you know, you can use this on any real-time system. But the limitation, again, was the CT resolution. So our limit there was really four to five copy differentiation. We could determine 20-fold changes. The only way we could do that was running a high number of replicates. So we had to run technical replicates and in order to get statistical confidence um, in the actual copy call. Completely impossible for us, regardless of how many replicates we use, when we went beyond five copies. So we tried over and over to determine you know, five to six copy uh, differentiation. Couldn't do that using our TACMAN copy number assays, but then digital PCR is an approach that you can use and to rescue that uh, to actually get accurate counts. Clicker is starting to die. The overall workflow is extremely simple. Um, there's nothing novel again to this. Uh, I told you before, it's just as simple as just taking your sample, the master mix, whatever assay that uh, for the locus you're trying to interrogate, you know, how many copies you have. You can actually mix in a reference assay as well uh, simultaneously. Uh, the system can actually detect in two targets. The reason why you would uh, run a reference assay with the Vic fluorophore is that so you could be certain that when you actually look at the copy counts, that the copy counts that you got are referenced back to a control input. So let's say something like if you knew that RNAs P was present in your sample at a certain you know, number of copies, or if gap DH, for example, was non, non uh, changing, if it's a static expressor, you can actually use that as a control. Because if you didn't use a control, along with the target that you're trying to interrogate, you could easily get a false negative assumption, right? Because you could just look at the results and say, oh, I have no HIV copies present in the sample. 
Well, how do you know there was none, none there? It could be that you just didn't add anything to those wells, right? So you use a control to actually you know, guarantee that, yes, we have sample introduced because that's being exhibited by the copy counts of our control gene. And so that's, that's the approach that we recommend is actually using um, a two-target approach. So the machine can actually count with both. You just mix all this together. The system actually loads up the array for you again, pop it into the system, and this is the actual readout. And I want to focus on this now because uh, I told you, I, I kind of lied a little bit. I said, you know, digital PCR is, is just simple distribution and it's just an endpoint determination, right? You're just basically distributing, running PCR, and then just getting a count. I forgot to mention why we call it digital PCR. Did anybody figure out why it's called digital PCR? It's, it's just a binary determination, right? Yes or no, yes or no. You know, is, it, is the well black or did it light up? So that's why we call it digital PCR, you know, like ones, ones and zeros with computers. Now, where we're a little bit different here with this uh, digital suite analysis software, what actually sets us apart, digital PCR is a really hot area right now. There's a lot of other of our competitors are in this market. Um, how we're differentiated from them is that we actually combined endpoint digital analysis with real-time data as well. So we enable you to actually capture the real-time CT plots and then go back and determine if the, uh, the, the, the data that you're getting is actually real by combining a CT value. So by using that approach, what we can do is this. So we can use digital PCR together and couple it with genotyping, um, a genotyping run, or it's say a gene expression run, right? We can go back and say, okay, not only do we get an endpoint analysis, we're trying to determine basically, you know, what these, you know, missed calls or non, or, or like off calls are. You know, is this really a different allelic variant? Is there something else going on? Was there, was our copy number or variation um, present in the actual polymorphism in that locus? And is that what's actually thrown off these clusters? Or is this just a random spurious amplification event that has absolutely nothing to do with what's really present in my sample? So by combining digital PCR with the you know, genotype and cluster calling or gene expression data, we can go back and look at these two data points as an example and say, okay, was this real or was this not real? We go back here and say, did we see a CT value? Did we actually see an amplification plot come up? Did we see exponential rise? In this case, we didn't, right? There's, it's actually pointing to this area here, it's hard to see, but um, area over here where there's no amplification. So whatever this fluorescence was, was just something that had nothing to do with true amplification of your target. So it allows the researcher to go back and actually rescue ambiguous results. Right? This was never really possible before. And then with this, you, know, you look at this one sample that actually occurs off cluster here. Well, you get confirmation by going back and looking at the actual amplification curve that was generated. So that's what actually sets us apart from the competition. A lot of the other digital PCR providers only provide you the endpoint analysis. They only provide you this view because they don't capture the data in real time as well, whereas we allow you to go back and you know, rescue ambiguous results. So that's, uh, that's a key point there. A new battery. I'll, uh, I'll start concluding the talk here by talking about <laughs> somatic mutation detection uh, because I think this is a nice segue into you know our upcoming talks. You know that Andy uh, will be delivering on you know the ion torrent and the AmpliSeq cancer panels. Uh, you know Tony actually mentioned those this morning as well. But uh, somatic mutation detection is something of, of, of extreme interest, obviously. So we, uh, from a, a next generation sequencing standpoint, but then also from a qPCR standpoint recognize the need to come up with assays um, that can actually interrogate these rare variants. These uh, somatic mutations, uh, they're actually present, let's say, in a tumor sample at a very, very small frequency or small percentage. You know, if this mutation is off by a single base, it's just a single base polymorphism, how can we actually interrogate and re uh, recognize that polymorphism when it's in the presence of a dominant wild-type background? Uh, a dominant wild-type background that's identical uh, genetically with the exception of a single base, how can this assay actually differentiate and tell you that that's, uh, that's a true mutant signal? So we developed uh, you know, what we call you know, CAS pcr or the mutation detection assays, to answer that question as well as uh, questions of, you know, let's say, like circulating tumor cells. So there's a lot of interest now in just you know, from a blood draw, looking at these few um, you know, cells that are actually just you know, wandering through the bloodstream. They could be as few as just like one or two cells like you know floating around in a milliliter of blood 
how can we actually get assays, uh, these rare uh, tumor cells, detected uh, with, um, with enough sensitivity. So we embarked on a specific TACMAN PCR. This is actually um, different from you know, allele-specific PCR, which has been described in you know, current protocols or you know, the, the Maniatis books. You know, allele-specific PCR was used as, you know, as much as like 20 years ago. Um, but where CAS PCR um, is actually different from allele-specific PCR is that we, we did a little twist on the assay itself. So in the assay, what we have is we have a probe. And I have it shown here, as, it just says ASP, that's an allele-specific probe. So that's the probe trying to detect our actual mutant target. The probe actually terminates at the three prime end, right above the mutation. So we expect that if it was not complementary, that the three prime end base would be floating off, right? It wouldn't be sitting down perfectly, and it wouldn't amplify. But we know in reality that you know oligonucleotides, you know, with hybridization, things are always like coming on and letting go, coming on, letting go. You will still get significant amplification, even if there's a mismatch of that base right there. And in that same assay we added also a blocker. So when, when it's, where it says ASB, that's an allele-specific blocker. This is an oligonucleotide that's complementary and will sit down to your wild-type um, uh, wild um, region. So basically what happens is it effectively blocks or quenches that, uh, the wild-type um, you know, genotype. So what that does is basically allows us to just PCR amplify only the mutation, even though the mutation is present at very, very, very low frequency. Because if we didn't block the wild type out, it would still amplify, right? This specific target, it still would sit down and give a significant amplification. So basically, that's how we, you know, uh, we came up with these CAST uh, PCR mutation detection assays. We're very, very efficient at picking out these rare, you know, like a needle in a haystack, you know, this, this uh, rare variant. Example here, uh, I mentioned allele-specific PCR. So if you just basically look at single base mismatches, you know, obviously here we have a, a GC perfect match, right? So let's say that three prime base was a perfect match. We're getting a CT value of 27 cycles. If we had a mismatch, a deliberate mismatch of a GT, you can see that we're actually only delaying the amplification by a single cycle. We're still getting significant amplification. So if you compare that now to this, you know, CAS PCR approach where we use this blocker to block out the, uh, the, the dominant wild type background, what happens is this. In the presence of the mismatch, we almost completely, or actually, we just kill the PCR entirely in the mismatch. We only get, we get the CT matches uh, when it's perfect. So this is basically just, we've demonstrated this, and these, these assays were released um, actually about a year ago. We've actually built onto this list, because what's happening now is, you know, the, the story again that we're trying to tell you is the, the entire gene genetic analysis uh, workflow. Uh, basically going from you know, hypothesis-free discovery on the ion torrent systems, which you'll be hearing about this afternoon, and then moving towards you know, a more focused pinpoint uh, validation using qPCR. So these are like two huge parts of our business that, we, that are without a doubt complementary. And so we're trying to match the content that we're seeing on the ion torrent side of the business with all their, their, uh, their AmpliSeq panels. Right? So all the mutations that they're showing on those panels, we want to give researchers the ability to go back and look at those same mutations and validate those mutations uh, using our CAST uh, PCR assays as well. So we're actually building uh, uh, to this list. Uh, right now we have you know, 285 mutations, but we're building and building. So we have a perfect match to um, you know, the, the, the PGM AmpliSeq cancer panels. And you saw the slide earlier. This is actually a, a, a duplication of, of Tony's slide from earlier. But this is just highlighting what I just you know, said a second ago, that we really want to present like, the entire uh, workflow uh, for the researcher. The ability to just come in, use the PGM, and uh, run these AmpliSeq panels, and uh, basically just take those results very easily in a streamlined fashion, move from that system over to Quant Studio, and do validation there um, stream, uh, seamlessly. And not only, of course, is this for the mutation assays, this is for basically any area of research, you know, genotyping, you know, microRNA profiling, uh, looking at, you know, let's say, non-coding RNAs, a lot of interest lately in understanding what non-coding RNAs do. All, of, all of this non-coding RNA information is being generated, of course, from next generation sequencing. And so we provide a way of actually using TACMAN assays that are specific for all these non-coding RNAs. Uh, we design them all actually already in advance. And uh, basically, we provide those on our websites for researchers to validate um, and complete the entire workflow. 
And again, this is Tony's slide too, I stole this. So this is just to complete the whole message um, and tie in the story of what you know, Tony started, what I talked to you about today, and then what um, our speakers this afternoon will be talking about as well when, it, when we talk about next generation sequencing. We really you know, wanted to provide the entire solution for the researcher, the entire workflow. 